On this week's episode of Van Life, we sit down with our good friend John, who's an MQ-9 Reaper pilot stationed in... John shares a lot of insight on this career field, so you don't want to miss it. We hope you enjoy. Casey and I have been best friends with John since college. We all attended Oregon State University together, and we're debt 685 flying beeves. Go beeves! We've really been looking forward to this interview, so come, sit down with us, and let's pick John's brain. Where the intel guys come in, they tell you what's happening in each theater that you're flying. Uh, you get a weather update in each theater, and then you split apart, and now all the crews go and get ready to change out their counterparts who are you know, currently flying or, or not, and uh, get, get all your computers set up, uh, talk to the guy in the seat currently, and they'll say, this is what's going on, this is what we're looking at, this is why we're looking at it, do you have any questions? No, I got it, man. Cool, go home. Spend time with your wife and kids, whatever. I got it from here. Once I'm in that seat, I'm now in charge. And uh, that is a humbling experience the first time. I mean, I was still a second lieutenant the first time I did that. Can you imagine? Like, I had been in the Air Force less than two years, and I took command of a plane in a mission, a very lethal plane in lethal mission, and I was ready to execute that. That's, that kind of turnaround is, is intense, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think there's any airframe that does that. I think by the time you're pulling triggers in an F-15 or F-16, I'd assume... You're five, six years in. Yeah, you're a captain. Yeah. So that's pretty, as a, as a 2LT doing that. Yeah. What is it? Everyone says when they finally see one, they all say that's a lot bigger than I thought it was. Yeah, it's the like, size of an F-16. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's actually closer to the size of an A-10. Sixty-six foot wingspan. You know, it's not a. It's an airplane. Is it true you're in a a box per se, a mm -hmm. aluminum metal box? Basically, a storage container with a bunch of computer equipment. You walk in. What is immediately like, whoa, what are people surprised by? Does no. it feel like getting in a cockpit? Is that what it really? Feels it does like? because it's tight. So it has a prop? Yep. And then what is the armament? What, you know, what is that kind of stuff like? Uh, your t typical loadout is for AGM-114 Hellfire missiles, but it can be equipped with 500-pound uh, bombs as well. So it's just literally a lethal eagle of death. That's always there. It's just It makes me wonder why people fight us, because, yeah. It's the Reaper. It's the Reaper talking about one of your shots yeah let's talk about our shots okay let's do it the it was time for the reaper was almost out of gas it's time to bring it home and uh we do you know we have set amount of time while on target to to execute training because we have to stay current which means for the viewers that what that means is we have to practice what you know we're trained to do a set amount of times in in a specific time period so that we can just so we remember, you know, the muscle memory is there, the procedures are there. And you got called and you guys just have to be doing what's loaded up. So, yeah. so I made a joke to my sensor operator. I was like, all right, man, we're, you know, RTB, uh, we got we to gotta get these currencies, you know, hacked. Find me something to shoot. You know, I said it as a joke and, you know, I'm heads down. I'm not looking at the screen. I'm, I'm typing away. Is that how you guys do it? Like you guys just find a random rock out in the desert and go blow your ordinances? Well, not, not really, but we pretend to, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or we'll track a car or something. To get your cordons. Yeah. To get your currencies. Yeah. I see We go through all the motions except pulling the trigger. But what happens if you're fully loaded, unfired? Do you ever have to deplete those no. before? No. You'll just land. Um, unless it's like an emergency situation. You can, you know. Okay. Is there a range for that kind of stuff? There's usually an area. Yeah. yeah. To empty out your ordinance. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so, yeah. I told my sensor operator, I'm, you know, I my nose is in the computer as I'm trying to coordinate airspace through the instant messaging and whatever. And, uh, and, I, and I told him, I was like, hey man, like, you know, find me something to shoot. And he, you know, a couple minutes go by and we're just flying along and he goes, hey, uh, hey sir, I think you should look at this. I was like, what is it? Like, I'm busy, like, what, what do you want? He's like, no, sir, you, you need to look at this. I look my head up and we see these four dudes in the Middle East uh, trying to pull a tarp over something in the back of their truck. It's just, you know, a standard uh, four by four kind of truck. And 
in the bed of the truck was this piece of equipment with a very long barrel sticking out over the cab. So I like quickly get like in the instant messaging room or whatever, get a hold of, you know. Uh, so you basically say on I am, hey, check this out. Like, I, are you still watching my feed? They, okay. they, they had the same reaction I did. They were like, oh, oh. <laughs> so they're like, hang on, hang on, hang on. And so like, uh, you know, this is, a, you know, the height of when uh, the final battle of Mosul. Oh, okay. And in, in the final push. The final push to, sure. to eradicate ISIS. And so eventually the, the right people got on the line and yeah, he, he, he gave me the lowdown. He gave me the nine line, which is the uh, approval authority to expend ordinance in a legal way, in, you know, in the laws of war. Um, we, were, we were told to quickly, it's called molding, meld eyes onto a specific grid where we did, and we, we saw these guys. We got really lucky that this car was traveling in the same direction that we were, because we were, go, we were RTB, we were going yeah, home, home out yeah. of gas. So if they were going the other way, we couldn't have turned around to go get them. So you literally had just a little bit of time to make this happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, we you know, got spun up, we got the nine line, and, and then all of a sudden they got called off, and we were like, oh, well that's a bummer. Okay, well, keep, keep on going home. And then they're like, nope, change yeah, our minds. Four dudes, there were three in the cab and one in the trunk, and. When the missile hits, you see something go fly off the back of the, the cab and uh, the car explodes and it goes off the road and crashes and you, you see all the secondaries of the ammunition going off. And yeah, from ammunition from the Hellfire? No, for, for, for the, from the air, it was a big anti-aircraft gun. So there was confirmation that they had something. Yeah. Something. So how does that work? Is there a crew of guys that go out there to do the KIA and all that kind of stuff? No, we, we, do, we do it ourselves. You do it yourself. So well, you I just mean, hover over. We hover over for a second, make sure nobody's moving. Yeah. It's very humane. Okay. You know? You explain that. Like, we, we are never out to maim someone. Our intention is not to blow your legs off, but you live. The practices in which we do, like, you're gonna die, but it's yeah. not gonna hurt. You're not even gonna know. Yeah, sure. It's just gonna be over. It's, yeah, right. So. The Reaper's gonna come for you. Yeah. I totally understand that. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you're not out here trying to commit atrocities. No. No, I, I get that aspect. But what the, the interesting, man, the interesting dynamic is the. We the actually character. get in trouble when we mess up a shot. Yeah, and, I can only and, imagine. And someone's leg gets blown off and, and they survive. Yeah. We get in trouble because that's cruel. I understand that. Yeah. The scan over. Yeah. That's the part that is different where you do that and then you have this image that's just in your face of what you just did and you just sit there for a while, you know, and just yeah. observe it all. That's, that's a dynamic that's interesting to me. It's sobering. Is it? Is that what it feels like? Do you feel after you pull that trigger and you feel like, okay, I took care of these bad guys, what is that surveillance moment like? You feel a lot of things. Especially when you double check. What if you didn't find that armament? Yeah. I mean, you feel a lot How, of things. What would you have felt like? Well, I probably wouldn't. I mean, ignorance is bliss, right? Like, I didn't. It was a total fluke that we found that thing. It was yeah. pure luck. But if you didn't find that weapon... Do you think you would have felt, oh, sh I just killed like four innocent dudes potentially? Oh, I don't think the strike would have gotten approval to. So you felt like no matter what, you would have had just not just justification, but you would have had okayness in your head that this was good. Yeah. And you would have been able to have the same feelings, surveilling, no matter what you saw, that okay. I did everything in my power to confirm that this was the right call. Okay. I think that's an important point yeah. is that one thing I do think the military does well is create an, an understanding of the chain of command so that when you do your job and you do it right... You don't have to worry about a thing. You don't have to worry about a thing. You can trust your training, you can pull that trigger, and you can feel like you did the right thing. Yep. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. you know? My question is, though, is like, if you didn't see the weapons that they had, do you ever think you would have looked back and questioned 10, 15 years later? Man, I wonder if those guys were innocent and I like pulled that trigger and it wasn't a weapon. Oh, it hasn't even it hasn't even been that long and I've had that question. You already have. Yeah, of course I have. Yeah, yeah. But that goes back to my point. You can't go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. It will eat you alive. Okay. No, I totally understand that. 
That's do, why you just... I, I can't. I am, it's not that I can't, it's that I won't. It, what happened has happened. Yeah. We can live with that, or we can't. I'm choosing to live with it. So then shots for shots happen afterwards. Well... Do you feel like there's camaraderie within that? Did you feel like... It's morbid good? to say, but yeah. No, it's not morbid to say. It's important. It's part of the healing process, man. It's part of war. Yeah. It's what people don't well, understand. Well, what I mean by morbid is, you know, it's... Uh, you're celebrating death. You're embracing death. I think that's a better word for it. And that's the way I would describe it, too, is that, you know, we train for years to do this. Yeah. And we got to do it. And let's look at the reality. Blowing shit up is cool. It's exciting. Yeah, I it's mean, something that people don't get to do. There's a thrill in victory. Yeah, and that's exactly what that is. There's thrill in victory. And it's it's not disrespectful. I think if you're doing it, I kind of hope that if I were to be killed in combat, they would do the same. And that's the thing, though. And that's the thing about serving the United States military, is if we were to die in combat, we would feel that way, because of what we're serving and what we represent. If anything, almost Valhalla. Almost yeah. Like. Hell yeah. I'm, I'm huge on the whole Viking Valhalla thing. You know, thing. you get yeah. it, right? Yeah. Like, and I feel the same way, too. I wonder if these kids feel the same way. I wonder if ISIS, you know, like, isn't that, it's different. And I think it is different, yeah. There's evil, and you've seen that. Guys getting their heads locked off, you know. And yeah, I think that kind of what you're getting at, I think, is the most important aspect in all this, is that there's a structure and the words like killer and murderer and, and things like that, they don't really work within the structure of how we think. There's too many checks and balances for those words to get thrown around. That's why I'm not okay with murder. See what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's not murder. There's 50 steps yeah. before even the idea of murdering somebody. Like, it's not like a premeditated It's thought. not a light <laughs> yeah, right. you know, process. It's heavy. It's vetted. <sighs> Thousands of hours. Thousands of hours. These are bad people. Yeah that are doing bad maybe things. Maybe they aren't bad. You know what? I want to make a point to say that maybe they're not bad people, but they've made bad choices. Ooh, that's an interesting point, too. And I think and that's a point of respect that you're hitting on. That I think is choices point. have consequences. Sure. There's bad people in the American forces. Yes. There's bad people in the American forces. Yes. 100%. Yeah. There could be good people. I want to say... There could I be firmly believe that... I like, know. I believe that they believe in what they're doing. There's that point. Yeah, they do believe in what they're I doing. I respect that. I'm going to kill them. <laughs> but I respect it. And that's, you have to respect your enemy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sun Tzu, man. Sun Tzu, man. Yeah. You have to. You have to. You were the second person I told. Okay. I actually called my dad. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, I guess it was the morning after because, it, you know, it was midnight and he was already asleep. But I, I kind of told him the same thing. He took it. Much in, in the same way that you did, kind of cautiously. He's like, okay, uh, you know, how, how do you feel? Like, tell me about it, et cetera, et cetera. I told him the story and I, I told him the same thing I just told you is that I, I didn't feel anything and that kind of bothered me. But it, it in turn, in time, it, the feelings come and that's, again, that's when I knew I'm gonna be okay. That's good, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's your body's natural way of grieving, you know, because those good, Good guys kill bad people and feel bad things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't pity them. I don't feel bad about what I did. If there's anything, I respect them because I can understand signing up for something with a blank check. Interesting. Based upon what you believe. So there's a mutual respect. Sure. I respect his right to die for his cause. Do you ever question if you're fighting for the, the wrong cause? Not a day in my life. Do you think if you questioned that, you would have a lot more issues with pulling that trigger? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really I've seen horrible things like we've you know talked about, and America is not perfect, but it is good in its heart and in its principles. It is good. That's a good point. Yeah. There's a, a common idea about PTSD. You want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, I don't, I don't, I've never experienced PTSD, especially in the, in the sense of the stigma of it, of what you see on TV. You know, I don't wake up in the middle of the night with sweats, uh, afraid of being wherever I was in my head. Uh, I'm not dismissing it. I've never experienced that. Um, but 
I'm trying to find the right way to say this. Th those experiences of you know extreme violence when you are put into those positions and you're asked to do what your what your job is uh, and execute extreme violence and you don't you don't forget them and it's not like it's this constant thing like movie playing in my head but they those thoughts pop up and they they change the way that you look at the outside world the way that you make decisions in your life it gives it certainly gives you an appreciation for how quickly it can go. Um, so again, I've never experienced it in the traditional sense of it, but there will be just random times during the day where I remember pulling the trigger and watching people die. Yeah. Uh, it's really unique in the RPA world because, you know, in F-16, they lock on their target on their HUD and they pull the trigger and they fly away and, and it's over. You know, they, they don't see anything. But I watched the whole thing happen in high definition. And the first time you see a human being explode in high definition yeah. is not something that is a joke. Uh, well, you know, you're talking about stigmas. Like, the biggest thing I can say to anybody is that this, it's not a video game. Yeah. As someone who plays a lot of video <laughs> games, I can go on Call of Duty and murder thousands of virtual people. but what I do for a living is not a game. I think a lot of it has to be who you are as a human being. Yeah. I think that there is, I think I would struggle being in that community and doing that and then coming home to Casey at the end of the day. That's, yeah, that's the biggest, from what I've heard, is one of the strangest things. That, you know, when you deploy, you, you can compartmentalize your thoughts. What is LRE? So it's the launch and recovery element. Uh, based upon the way the aircraft operates with satellites, there's a two second delay when the guys who are flying via satellite, uh, you know, when they say plane go left, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, then the plane goes left. Okay. So as you know, yeah, that's you, bad. That's, you, you can't do that when you're 10 feet off the ground, you no. know, going 100 knots. So uh, the way that my job works is it's a line of sight connection Essentially, it's a giant remote controlled plane, and so all my inputs are instantaneous, which allows me to put it on the ground safely as well as take it off safely. Okay, so yeah. you make up for the lag so it doesn't yes. happen. Yes, yes. Gotcha. So that's a critical mission. So you are there more in-house, in theater. Yes. As this is happening. Yes. So that means that you've gone through some pretty tactical training. Yes. Let's hear about that. In tactical training? Uh, yeah. I went to a, a much smaller version of that. Sure. And I learned very quickly that I was not built to be uh, a prisoner and I will die fighting. Um, <laughs> you get smacked around a little bit. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to eat your heart. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. Good enough. Yeah. Um, they taught me. That's cool. Another Air Force school, they taught, you how, taught me how to shoot, taught me how to drive, taught me how to fight. And this is because. Uh, Taught you how to fight, right? So some some you know jujitsu kind of. What we didn't feel training. It was pretty one on one. You know, okay. you find somebody who's about your size and you go at it. Yeah. For the eyes or whatever. Yeah. So, are you flying or is somebody else flying when this happened? Someone else was flying it. Okay, where are you? Walking into the box or? No, I'm I'm in the seat. I had just turned off my transmitters so okay. that they could turn theirs on. Okay, gotcha. So you guys yeah. are doing the swap. Yeah, we're doing the swap. Okay. And they kill the engine. Okay. This thing starts falling, oh, and I was shit. like, Okay. Okay. Well, here we go. <laughs> oh, okay. Turned on my transmitters again. You know, dumped the nose through the throttle forward. So you didn't even wait for this guy to like try to recover. You just immediately knew what you needed to do. And jump back right, I saw I saw the RPM rolling back, okay. and we're, we all of a sudden. But theoretically, he had the aircraft. He could have done what I did, sure. except that, you know, in the moment you're tumbleweed and you don't, there wasn't enough time to figure out the problem. So you just immediately just took I over. just took the plane, dumped the nose, threw the throttle forward and prayed that the engine would restart. Atta and, boy. And it did. Okay. And at that point we, you know. Did it restart because of engine failure or from prop speed catching up? Prop speed. Okay. So, you know, we have our. Yeah, so by pitching the nose forward. I had to get that airspeed you, back. You saved it. Yeah. Yeah, you got it going fast. And, it, and it kicked back on. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So we had to then dump fuel because we're too heavy okay. and, and bring it back for a landing because it's a, the checklist says land as soon as possible. Okay. Air restart. So it was because of a killed engine mm -hmm. by a crew member mm -hmm. that you ended up having to dump and save. Mm -hmm. 
and then you don't feel to get back on. Yeah, it was the like, scariest eight seconds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah buddy. All right, cool. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate my man. And uh, let's go get some chicken wings. Yeah, chicken wings. <laughs>